Hey everyone, this is Ken Stoltzfus. I wanted to talk to you today about scale development. Uh, this is a little bit different from what's in the textbook, actually uh, pretty significantly different from what's in the textbook. So for the quiz at the end of this unit, um, the material from the PowerPoints and from the textbook uh, will all be covered on the quiz. I wanted to talk today about scale development. Um, there are a lot of different types of tests or measures or instruments. We've kind of used all those words um, interchangeably. And uh, some of those uh, types of, of instruments, things like um, projective tests, you know, the thematic app perception test, the TAT, the Rorschach, developing those is, is really different than what we're going to talk about today. You might remember from when we went over the syllabus, um, if you read over the syllabus and listened to the course intro introductory video that I did, um, I talked about the final project for this class uh, is a, an instrument that you're going to develop, and that's going to be a, a scale. Um, it's not going to be a projective test or, or something like that. It's going to be um, what we call in, in psychological measurement a scale. You've probably used scales. If you've done any, if you've seen anything like the Beck Depression Inventory, you know, uh, I think if I remember correctly, a 20 item scale that asks questions about depression and gives you a score that says whether somebody has depressive symptomatology or not. That's an example of a scale. Uh, so when we're talking about a scale, we're talking about a measure that has a score that can, can be summed, and it's an objective measure. So it's going to have questions that you answer, um, and it's not going to be sort of based on projections or kind of ideas as much as, as solid, concrete um, answers. Um, often, the, uh, the scales that we use um, in psychology, they often use the Likert scale model. And you're familiar with that. It's, it, we'll talk more about that in a bit, but you're probably all familiar with Likert scales. And as we talked about early on in this class, uh, this would be ordinal interval level data that's generated from these scales, most usually. So um, ordinal meaning that we know that there are there's a ranking or hierarchy between the categories. So we know that there's a difference between strongly agree, strongly disagree, at the or yeah, sorry, between strongly agree and agree. Um, and so in order level data, we know that there's a difference between those categories that one is ranked on, on top of the other. Um, but what we don't know is sort of how to quantify or how to put a number to the distance between those two concepts. Um, so what we do, though, for the sake of statistics is we treat those data like they're interval level data. So we kind of act like strongly agree is one and agree is two and not sure is three and disagree is four, and strongly disagree is five. Um, and so even though we can't really assign numbers to our agreement in, in the real world, we sort of do that for statistical purposes. So that's what we mean when we say that this is ordinal interval level data. And as I said earlier, an example of this would be the back depression inventory. So what I want to do today is I want to just tell you a little bit of the steps that we go through in scale development. And remember, this is going to be the final project for the class. Um, and so this is sort of my introduction to what your final project is going to look like. When I'm with you in person in late March in Claypedo, we're going to spend most of the week going over this, preparing for it. I'm going to take you to the computer lab to show you how to do the statistical tests. So if this seems a little bit abstract to you now, that's fine, because I'm going to go over with you um, how to do this um, in practical terms when we're together later this semester. Um, so these are the steps in scale development. We start with item generation. We move to content adequacy assessment. Then we um, take the items that we've developed and we make a scale from them. We get in, into issues or we resolve issues such as scaling and scoring. We write directions for the instrument. Then we pilot test the instrument. We do what's called factor analysis, which I'll explain more about in a minute. We determine reliability and validity, and we've talked about those in, in the previous weeks. And then the final step is replication. So what I'm going to do in today's lecture is just sort of take you through that process so you understand in kind of general terms what it looks like and then like I said we'll talk more about that when I'm with you later this semester. So the item generation section this is when you come up with the questions or the items um, usually they're not actually written as questions they're usually written more as statements that people agree or disagree with. So this is where you come up with those items for the test or for the, um, the measure that you're making up the scale. There's a couple of different ways to start generating items and we classify these as, as deductive versus inductive. In a deductive model, what we do is we start with a theory, and we try to develop items based on that theory. Um, inductive is kind of the opposite, where we develop items just based on experience, because maybe there's not a theory that we, that, that's been developed for what we want to study. 
in this case, if we do it inductively, um, it's usually not, that's usually not recommended. Usually, if possible, we want to start from theory. And so usually the deductive approach is what's recommended. But sometimes the inductive approach is necessary if what we want to measure doesn't have a theory that really exists that explains how we should develop items. Um, if we have to do a more inductive approach where we have to sort of base it on experience and kind of just a general common sense, if possible, we want to involve experts or people that are very well qualified in that process so that we have some sense that these items are coming from somewhere that's at least somewhat reliable and scientific. Um, that's why we sort of want to uh, use a deductive approach if at all necessary or if at all possible. Um, so let me give you an example of what I mean by item generation. Um, this is really uh, um, just sort of based on my experience, my research. A lot of my research has been uh, done on university students and um, the reason, well, it's been, uh, my research has been focused on uh, alcohol use in university students, drinking in university students. Some of the background reading that I've done relates to um, the reasons that university students drink alcohol. So this is a, a, a situation where we can use a deductive approach because there's actually pretty good, there's a pretty good theory out there, or a couple of pretty good theories that, that would say that the reasons that, color, that university students drink alcohol, um, typically there tend to be two, socialization, um, university students tend to drink when they're hanging out with their friends. Coping would be the other reason. Uh, a lot of university students seem to drink when they're having a bad day, when they fail a test, they break up with their boyfriend or girlfriend, that sort of thing. So that's, that's a deductive approach. We've got this theory, and now we're going to develop items based on measuring socialization and coping as uh, motivation to drink. So here's a couple of uh, examples of items we might come up with if we're developing a scale to measure the reasons that university students drink alcohol. We might have an item on there that says something like this. When I drink alcohol, it's usually in order to have fun with my friends. And of course, that would be a socialization item. We'd be measuring to see, does the student usually drink alcohol when they're with their friends? So that's related to socialization. Another item we might want to include would be uh, something like this. I'm more likely to drink alcohol on a bad day than on a good day. And that would be an example of a coping item um, where, where we want to see, you know, is the student drinking to cope with a bad day? And what we would do is we would just develop a whole pool of items. So if we want to have a 15 to 20 item uh, scale, we might develop 30 or 40 or 50 items. And then what we want to do is we want to pick the best ones. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit in a second how we do that. Before I get into how we pick the best items, though, let me give you a little bit of um, just sort of some guidelines for developing items. I mentioned this first one last week, but I want to just reiterate it. One of the things we want to be really sure about is that our items focus on a single construct or a single issue. We don't want them to be what we call double-barreled items. So in English, double-barreled means uh, it kind of comes from guns. And some guns, some shotguns, for instance, have two barrels. And so you can shoot uh, out of both barrels. We don't want our items to be like that. We don't want them to kind of have two different points. So an example of, of an item we wouldn't want to use because it would be double-barreled would be this one. I drink alcohol to have fun and to socialize with my friends. Well, the problem there is it kind of covers two things, because what if I think it's really fun to drink alcohol by myself? How do I answer that, that question? Because I drink alcohol to have fun, but maybe I don't do it to socialize with my friends. Maybe I drink alcohol and play video games and, you know, watch TV or, you know, whatever. I, I, might, not, I might not be able to answer that question honestly because, or, or accurately because part of it's true and part of it's not true for me. So we want to make sure that our, our items just focus on a single issue. We also want to make sure that our items have, throughout the scale have a consistent perspective. So if we really want to know what a person's motivation is for drinking alcohol, we really don't need to get into what their friends think. Um, so an item like my friends have fun when we drink together, you can see how that measures something very different from, than I have fun when I drink with my friends. Because maybe the friends are having fun and maybe I'm sitting in the corner you know, passing out or crying. And so if, if what we really want is to measure the individual's perspective, we don't really want to ask other friends. We want to use that second item and make sure we have it from the perspective of the person who's being asked, um, who's, who's completing the scale. Uh, a third thing we want to keep in mind is we want to have short or simple items whenever possible. 
So sometimes this takes some doing because sometimes, you know, in, in psychology and in other similar fields, you know, in university, we teach you all kinds of big words. And sometimes those words end up in the, in the scales that we develop. And so we don't want to do that. What we want to do is something short and simple. So we wouldn't want to say something like this in our item. We wouldn't want to say, when I'm with my same age peers, I tend to consume beverages that contain ethanol in order to reach a point of inebriation, right? Because nobody's going to understand what that means. What we'd want to say is, when I'm with my friends, I usually end up getting drunk. That would be an example of, um, of a short, simple item that we could use. People understand what that means. Even people that maybe have some cognitive, um, you know, would maybe be lower functioning in, in terms of their cognitive abilities, or people who um, aren't native English speakers, most people are going to understand that second one a lot better than that first item. Uh, we want to avoid negative or reverse scored items. Because when, when we use them with a Likert scale, it gets confusing. So if we say something like, I usually don't drink when I'm upset, and then we have people relate that on a Likert scale, if they disagree with the fact that they don't drink, you can see how that gets confusing, right? It's much easier to say something like, I usually drink when I'm upset, and then people either agree or disagree with that. But once we get that double negative in there, when we've got the don't, and then we've also got a disagree in the Likert scale, it tends to confuse people, and we're not always sure we get good, accurate results from that. So usually we want to avoid uh, negative. We want to word our items in the positive. Sometimes we do use what's called reverse scored items. And what that means is sometimes we want to ask questions both ways. So sometimes we have items that when we're scoring the test later on or scoring the measure later on, we need to reverse the score. So um, we usually try to avoid that, but sometimes there might be theoretical reasons why we would run a question in a different direction. And maybe, maybe sometimes just to make sure we're getting an accurate sense of what the person is trying to tell us. Um, but generally, we want to avoid that. Uh, sometimes you will find that in scales, and it's not wrong. But if you can avoid it, it's better to avoid it. The last thing is sometimes people make the mistake of thinking, well, I shouldn't ask about the same thing in different ways. Actually, that's exactly what we want to do, because this is supposed to be a scale about one idea or one concept, one construct. And so we want to ask about that construct, that idea that we're interested in, in various ways. So if I'm asking about um, reasons college students or university students drink alcohol, I'm going to want to ask a couple of different questions about socializing with friends. It might be something like, um, when I'm with my friends, I tend to drink a lot of alcohol. Uh, when I want to socialize, I tend to drink with my friends. We might want to ask that a couple of different ways. And the more we can sort of saturate that content into the scale, probably the more accurate our scale is going to be. We don't want to ask about it just once. Um, we don't want to make our scale too long either, but usually having a, asking about things a couple of different ways, a few different ways, it's sort of helpful to make sure that we've really um, um, saturated our, our content into the scale. So the next thing we do, once we've got a pool of items generated, we need to determine whether our items measure our concept. And there's some way, there's some different ways of doing that. One of the simpler ways is to have a focus group. So this would be, you know, if you want to do our scale that we've been sort of talking about as an example, you know, reasons that university students drink alcohol, we could get five or ten university students and buy them some pizza and give them some candy and say, hey, will you come and sit with us for an hour? and talk about whether you think the items in the scale measure the reasons that university students drink. And maybe that group says, we think you're missing something. Or maybe they say, yeah, we think this is great. Um, so that's one way we can do it. Another way that's maybe a little bit more scientific would be to have individuals read items and compare those items to a theoretical definition of the construct. And so here, um, we want to maybe starting start to get into if 8 out of 10 of our um, of our reviewers agree on a certain item, then we're going to accept that item into our scale. So it's a little bit more kind of scientific than the focus groups, but not much. And then finally, there's some statistical approaches we can use. We can use factor analysis, which I'll talk more about in a minute, or we can use analysis of variance or ANOVA. Um, there's some ways to do that uh, statistically. I'm not going to get into those now. We'll talk a little bit more about some of those um, when, I'm, when I'm with the Enclector in person. So now we've got our items, you know, so we go through whether it's a focus group or a group of individuals who read and rate our items or whether we use statistics. We've identified the best items in our, in our pool of items, so we want to make those into our scale. But there's a couple last things we need to do before we finalize our scale. 
One of the things we need to do is we need to scale the items. And so we need to decide what Likert scale we're going to use or if we're going to use another scale. But Likert is most common because this is an introductory undergraduate class. I'm going to just stick with the Likert scale because it's what I know best. It's what most people know best. It's what most people use. We generally recommend that people use five, six, or seven point Likert scales. Um, an example of a seven point Likert scale would be strongly agree, agree, strongly, I'm sorry, strongly agree, agree, slightly agree, unsure, or we could say don't know, and then uh, slightly disagree, disagree, and strongly disagree. And then you can see for the six point scale, we just remove that middle section, that unsure, don't know. For the strongly or for the five point scale, we just want to strongly agree, agree, unsure, disagree, strongly disagree. And the general consensus among experts is that having five to seven points on our scale, that gives us enough variance that we're going to, we're going to get the variance we need to do the statistical procedures that we want to do. But we're not making the scale really, really complex. You know, if we've got 15 different points of agreement, how do you know if you agree uh, 13 points, 14 points, or 15 points on something. You know, it, it's just sort of too much for people to comprehend in their mind. So we don't want to, we want to have enough variance. So five to seven gives us enough. You know, two or three maybe wouldn't be enough variance. Um, but more than seven tends to be too complex. There is some debate in the field about whether we should use odd numbered scales. So you see with the five and the seven point scale, we've got a middle ground called unsure or I don't know. And some people like that. Other people say this causes satisficing. And what satisficing is, is it's a, it's a made up word that combines sacrificing and satisfying. So what it means is that people are sacrificing their point of view in order to satisfy the researcher. So if I've asked you something like, it's okay to punch someone that, that you don't like in the head. And maybe you really think it's okay to punch someone you don't like in the head but you're worried that I'm going to think you're a sociopath if you say that, if I read that on your, on your scale. But you don't want to say, oh, no, I'd never do that. I think that's wrong. So what you're going to do is you're going to, and you're going to just sort of jump into that middle category and say, oh, I don't know. I'm not sure. And that way you haven't completely told me a lie, but you also haven't put yourself out there as somebody that likes to punch people in the head when you're angry with them. Um, the other reason that people satisfy uh, is that it takes mental energy to do these scales, and sometimes people just don't feel like doing it. They get bored partway through, and they start just checking off that middle answer, and that seems to be sort of an easy way to get through the scale quickly. So I was sort of trained it's better to have a six-point scale, maybe than a five or seven. There's other people that really like to have a five or seven-point scale. There's not a right or wrong here. There's just uh, sort of disagreement among the experts on this. The other thing we want to do when we're developing our scale, um, sorry, I talked about scaling but not scoring. Let me just mention scoring really quickly. Um, one of the things we want to do with scoring is we want to have, um, we want to know, and when we add up the scores from our scale, uh, what does that mean? And there's two ways of thinking about this. Sometimes the scores, uh, we just say, you know, a higher score on our depression scale just means you have more depressive symptomatology. Other times we draw an imaginary line through those scores and we say any score above this cut point means that you have depression. Any score below means you don't have depression. So I didn't get that under my uh, PowerPoint. I'm sorry about that. I meant to put that on and I just, when I was going through, I just realized I didn't. But that's what we're thinking about with scoring. Usually we're adding up, um, we're adding up, uh, the score once a person has completed the, the, the scale, and that's, um, that's sort of how we're, we're identifying the score. And sometimes we've got a cut point. Other times, a lot of the scales, honestly, we just sort of have a range of scores where um, the higher the score, the more of that property is present for the person. Hopefully that makes sense. The last thing we need to think about in terms of scale construction is directions. Um, one of the things we need to be really sure about is that we keep our, develop, our directions clear and simple and as brief as possible. One of the things we know about directions is a lot of times people don't read them because it takes extra time. And so we really want to keep them as short as possible. But we do want to make sure that we've given people a, some understanding of what they need to do. So usually we say something like, uh, you know, thank you for agreeing to take the time to complete our scale. Uh, there's there's no right or wrong answer. Please just answer honestly and choose the best answer for you. 
Um, this is um, um, if there's a time that we want to say you have 15 minutes to complete this scale, and usually we'll say something like um, circle your level of agreement with each of the following statements if we're using that that typical Likert scale. Um, we do want to highlight, like I said, um, the time frame that people have for completing the the scale. If we have one, a lot of times we wouldn't impose a time frame. The other thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we give a time frame for um, what, if if people are, are talking in the scale or the scale focuses on agree on um, agreement about behaviors they've participated in. We want to give them a time frame for that. So with some of the some of the measures that we have of alcohol use. Um, you know, for, if we were doing a study on reasons for university student drinking, we might also want to give a scale that asks about the amount of alcohol they've consumed in the last month. And so there, we want to say something like, um, please, please complete the scale based on the last 30 days. And a lot of times we kind of have a sense that maybe people can't remember back much more than 30 days or they don't remember very accurately. So if we want to convert that into consumption over the, over the course of a year, we multiply it by 12. You know, something like that. Usually we don't go back more than 30 days. A lot of times either two weeks or 30 days would be kind of the, the standard for that. Some scales, you know, if you're, if you're talking about um, certain kinds of personality um, variables, we may, not need to, we may not need to give a time frame, but sometimes we do. Okay, the next thing we want to do then, once we've got our scale developed, we've chosen our items, we've developed, uh, we figured out what kind of scale we're using, how many points, and we figured out a scoring protocol, and we've written directions. Now it's time to test uh, the instruments. We call that pilot testing. And we want to make sure that the sample we choose for our pilot test is composed of the population for which the instrument's been developed. So in our case, if we were developing something about motivation or reasons for university students drinking, we'd want to make sure that our sample was university students. Um, and there's some disagreement about how big our sample needs to be. Some older um, estimates are out there would be that would say that we need between four to ten people per item. Um, newer ideas would say somewhere, you know, if we're using this technique that I'm going to talk about in a minute called uh, exploratory fa factor analysis, a lot of folks would say we need anywhere from 50 people to 150 people in our sample. So I mentioned factor analysis a minute ago. We, a lot of times we use factor analysis to um, determine the factor structure of our scale. And so there's a couple different kinds of factor analysis we use. I'm going to focus primarily on exploratory factor analysis. So this is a preliminary examination of the factor structure of our, of our measure, of our instrument. Um, what I mean by factor structure is this. Uh, in um, in a lot of concepts and a lot of constructs we want to measure in our scale, there might be multiple sub-concepts in that overall concept. So um, if our uh, construct of interest is reasons for university students drinking, there might be two sub-concepts in that, and the theory would say that there would be socially motivated drinking and coping motivated drinking. So that whole scale is about motivations for drinking, but we might have two factors. And those two factors are probably going to be pretty easy and clear to differentiate on our scale. Sometimes those factors are a little bit harder to differentiate. Like if you're getting into types of coping, sometimes there's not a clear line between the various types of coping. Um, and so sometimes it's harder to really tell what the factor structure of the scale is. And that's where this idea of um, exploratory factor analysis comes in. The exploratory factor analysis helps us to figure out whether our construct of interest, whether our scale measures a construct of interest, in a way that's, uni that's unidimensional, meaning that it's only got one factor. There's just sort of one idea associated with this. There aren't any sub-ideas. Or if it's multiple dimensional, if there's two or more factors, two or more sub-concepts involved in, in our scale, that we're measuring in our scale. So again, our, our, the example that I've been using for most of this lecture are um, reasons for university students drinking scale. We're thinking that's multidimensional because there's two sub-ideas in there, socially motivated drinking, coping motivated drinking. Um, that's a little bit about exploratory factor analysis. I'll explain more about that in a second. I wanted to just make a note, there's another type of factor analysis called confirmatory factor analysis. And this is a little bit more uh, complex, a little bit more difficult to do, but con confirmatory factor analysis uh, 
confirms the factor structure by examining the statistical significance of the model, as well as the relationships between the subscales and items. That's outside the scope of this course. It's something that not even everyone gets in a doctoral level program, so I'm not going to torture you all with that in this course. Just wanted to mention what that was. Okay, so a little bit more about exploratory factor analysis. So we do this exploratory factor analysis. I'll show you in person how to do this when I'm with you in Klaipeda. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out from this analysis, how many factors do we have? How many of those sub ideas do we have in our scale? And there's a couple ways we can do this. One is um, the value that's generated from our exploratory factor analysis is called an eigenvalue. And you might have seen this if you're in SPSS for other things, there's places where you can check um, for eigenvalues. And so um, that's the statistic that we use. And one way we can sort of start looking at how many, how many um, factors are in our scale, are measured in our scale, um, another way of saying that as we look at the dimensionality of the scale, would be the number of eigenvalues greater than 1.0. A related way that we can look at this is, is looking at the scree plot, which is just a plot of the eigenvalues. So let me show you how we do this. This is, um, this is just uh, an, a sample uh, from SPSS of, um, of a principal axis factoring, which is a type of exploratory factor analysis. And you can see um, on the, on the column on the very left is this factor, and then um, the next column says initial eigenvalues, and we want to look at that column that says total with the C next to it. So that total column, you can see that factor number one had six, uh, had a score of 6.2 in terms of eigenvalues. Um, factor two had a score of 1.229, and then factor three had a score of 0.719. So what we're saying there is that there's two factors, because there's only two factors uh, above 1.0. So we'd say that this scale, based on this, the scale is, um, is multidimensional. It's a two-factor solution. It's a two-factor scale. Another way of looking, or another way of determining the, um, the um, dimensionality of the scale is to look at the scree plot. And the screen plot is just taking, um, taking the eigenvalues and um, charting them in a graph, as you can see on the screen here. What we look for is when there's a sharp change in the slope of the line. So you can see that um, between the first eigenvalue, which is up at 3.9 somewhere, down to the second eigenvalue, which is a little bit below 2. By the way, this doesn't correspond to the SPSS chart I showed you a minute ago. This is a different example. We can see that there's a straight line there, and then there's a slightly turned line um, uh, down to the third eigenvalue. But at the third eigenvalue, we see a sharp turn. Um, and so I put a little arrow there that says elbow. We call this the elbow. When we get a sharp turn, what we, what we usually do is we say we're going to take the factors above that sharp turn. So in this case, again, we have a two-factor solution, or we would say this scale is multidimensional, it's a two-factor scale, because there's two factors listed above the, above the elbow and the scree plot. The problem with the elbow and the scree plot idea is that sometimes it's harder than this to tell where the elbow is, sometimes it's not clear, um, sometimes there's sort of two curves and we're not sure where to put that elbow. So a lot of times what we say is we look at a couple different things. We look at the eigenvalues themselves, we look at the scree plot, and generally, um, they tend to agree, and then that helps us to sort of know how to proceed in terms of thinking about the dimensionality of the scale. If that seems a little bit confusing to you, don't worry too much about it. I think it'll make more sense once we work on it a little bit in the computer lab. But why don't you just sort of give you that background? The next thing we need to do is check the reliability of our scale. And I'm not going to spend much time on that because you've had a whole lecture on reliability. I just wanted to say that I think Cronbox Alpha is probably the most common measure of reliability that we use with scale development. And if you remember, this gives us um, this gives us a value that tells us about internal consistency reliability within the scale. And we talked about um, how to interpret those alphas in another lecture. Um, generally, the higher the better. But remember, we don't want them too high above 0.9 because then we start to think, well, we don't have any. We're sort of asking about all the exact same thing. So we want some overlap, but we don't want to be all the exact same thing in our scale. We also want to check the validity of our scale. 
And you know, when we've done our pilot study, we want to our pilot testing, we want to check the validity. Again, last week we talked a lot about validity. I'm not going to repeat that lecture and torture you again with that. But I would say that convergent validity is probably the most common. And if you remember, this is a type of construct validity where we take our measure. Say we've got a measure of reasons university students drink alcohol. We might take a measure of something similar and give that to our, our sample as well when we're giving our first, um, when we're giving the instrument that we've developed, the scale that we've developed, we might give this more established scale. And then we look at whether there's a correlation between the two. If our scale comes up with totally different reasons than the other scale does for uh, university students drinking alcohol, uh, we might think maybe our scale is not too good. Sometimes it's hard to find a scale that measures exactly what we're developing, which makes sense because we don't want to develop a scale that already has a good scale out there um, for, for, an, uh, for a concept that already has a good scale that measures it. So a lot of times what we do is we find a scale that's kind of similar. And so if we were trying to develop um, a measure of depression in university students, we might also give them a, a just sort of a general measure of depression. So it's not exactly the same thing. But we have a sense that those scores should probably be related to each other fairly strongly. Finally, then we need to replicate it. Just because we've tested it once doesn't mean that now it's valid and reliable. Because remember we said last week we'd never say this test, this scale, this instrument is valid and reliable until the end of time. We just kind of say it's been valid and reliable in this administration. And so before we can put a lot of trust in it, we need to test it a few more times. Because that, that validity and that reliability that always varies from population to population, from administration to administration. And so we need, we've got that need for ongoing testing. Okay, that's it for this week. Um, these are a couple of reference or a couple of resources that might be helpful to you that I've used throughout the um, throughout the, the lecture in addition to your textbook, because uh, frankly, your textbook just didn't talk very much about how to actually develop a scale. I wanted you to know a little bit about that, partly because of what we're going to be doing later this semester. Um, I would say especially the second article, the, the Hinken article, uh, is really, it's a pretty good overview of how to develop a scale, and I've drawn from it quite a bit. Uh, you know, I've changed a few things, but I've drawn from it quite a bit in this lecture. Um, so if this is a little bit unclear, you could look that up. I think you can access that from LCC, and um, that might give you some, some more information about scale development. Okay, I hope you're all doing well. As usual, if you have questions or concerns, please email me and I'll be glad to get back to you. Um, and have a good week. I'll talk to you next week. Bye.